Good evening, Bahamas. I'm Christina McNeil, and this is MB12 for Monday, September 17, 2012, broadcasting from the Cable 12 studios on Robinson Road. In news tonight, police confirming that murders are down 17% compared to the same period last year. Another suspect shot during a police-involved shooting, the fate of ambulance workers on Grand Bahama after a sick out, concerns over an alleged death threat on the campaign trail, and an Olympian returns home still recovering from an injury. We have those stories and much more coming up tonight. Your MB12 starts right now. for joining us. Murders are down approximately 17% so far this year compared to last year. Commissioner of Police Ellison Greenslade says that's in part to the force's aggressive response to crime in general. But as Paige McCartney tells us in this report, the police chief says the work is far from over. There's a significant gap in the amount of murders that were committed so far this year compared to the amount committed to the same point last year, a gap of 17. But Commissioner of Police Ellison Greenslade said it's too early to rejoice. Up to this same time last year, there were 102 murders committed. However, that pace has slowed this year. To date, there have been 85. Greenslade has said that police have been insistently targeting prolific offenders to get them off the streets and behind bars. He said today that he believes police are turning a corner and are getting more accused criminals before the courts. Last week we took four persons to court charged for murder, murders on the same day. Today we're taking, I believe, 15 persons to court in charges ranging from murder. I believe in three of those cases the charges are murder and uh, armed robbery and any um, number of other serious crimes. And so officers have really been uh, pounding the beat. They've been working very, very hard. And with the full support of the communities of the Bahamas, we've been getting good results. Separate from murders, Greenslade said he's troubled by other violent crimes against the person that have not decreased. I'm very, very um, concerned about the numbers that I'm seeing. Um, and while we sometimes compare numbers, you know, one rape is a rape to too many. One murder is a murder too many. And we are at a stage in this country where we'd better pay attention. This has to stop. I'm telling you, we're working hard at it. There's a lot more hard work to be done, but I couldn't stress more forcefully the need for us to say no to this. It has to stop. However, a special report in the Nassau Guardian today highlights how the country's crime problem is outpacing the justice system. Attorney General Allison Maynard Gibson having said before that there are more than 400 murder accused out on bail. With that many accused murderers out on the street, the safety of witnesses to those crimes comes into question. The commissioner said, though, that since the start of the new fiscal year, the witness protection program has been revamped with more resources devoted to and more funds expended on on the program. And according to the commissioner, it's costly. He says he personally signs checks every week for about $10,000. The commissioner did not say how many people are currently under witness protection, but he said that weekly $10,000 bill covers three meals a day as well as the utility bills and medical bills of witnesses, their housing and transportation. There are days when I check mark things where I sense there's a level of discomfort. I make the interventions myself um, and I sign the, the actual checks. So we spend a lot of money. That's recurrent, meaning food stuff, medical supplies, um, the, the need to travel, uh, to transport people from place to place. That could be on island, it could be off island, it could be internationally. Recognize that when a person is in our protective custody, that person is with us 24-7, full time. Read tomorrow's edition of the Nassau Guardian, where the second part of the special report will focus on how witness intimidation is undermining the administration of justice. Reporting for MB12, I'm Paige McCartney. Well, a sore spot for police remains how aggressive many of them are perceived to be by members of the public. Just today, there was a police-involved shooting on Revax Drive in Penny Savings Bank subdivision where an 18-year-old was reportedly caught in a home by police who shot him after he allegedly confronted them with a knife. The suspect was taken to hospital and was in stable condition up to airtime. But according to the Commissioner of Police, there have so far been six police-involved shootings that ended fatally this year. Greenslade says all have been investigated and sent to the coroner's court. I've looked at all of the files as I always would. 
um, and I'm satisfied that all of them have been uh, properly investigated and that they've all gone on to Her Majesty's coroner. Um, in all of those cases, all of those cases except one, um, the victims were armed with illegal firearms, in all cases except one for the year to date. And, and while I have my feelings about them, all of them, the Commissioner does not have um, that opportunity to speak to, to, to what my opinion is. Greenslade says while he will always defend the use of force by the police if warranted, no officer is above the law. We are not protective when there's a police involved shooting. What we do, particularly where it's a fatal police involved shooting, is we ensure that Her Majesty's coroner is notified and attends at the scene. And we move to wrap those investigations up as quickly as we can. The file is then passed to Her Majesty's coroner and the investigation is not complete. Her Majesty's coroner will then convene a coroner's request if he or she so determines and will further investigate to determine if there is culpability on the part of the police. However, the commissioner says with 375 illegal weapons and more than 5,000 rounds of ammunition being confiscated from criminals so far this year, there are many instances where police force is justified. Eight emergency medical services workers in Grand Bahama could soon find themselves without jobs. The public hospital's authority suspended those employees without pay after they called in sick on Friday. After their suspension ends, Labor Minister Shane Gibson says PHA officials will determine if their services should be terminated. But that statement isn't sitting well with the union representing those EMS workers. Vonique Toot reports. Though he does not support illegal actions taken by union members, BPSU President John Pinder says the public hospital's authority did not follow due process when it suspended a number of EMS workers in Grand Bahama after they called in sick on Friday. He also criticized Labor Minister Shane Gibson, who commented on the matter today. Gibson told reporters this morning a number of lives were placed in jeopardy when eight emergency medical services workers failed to show up for their scheduled shifts between 4 p.m. and midnight on Friday and 12 a.m. to 8 p.m. on Saturday. Those workers were suspended for five days without pay. Pender claims the department's head was suspended for 10 days without pay. After their suspension ends, Gibson says they could be fired. Public hospital authority would make a decision as to whether or not their employment would continue. Um, obviously, you don't need those tight persons on the job. You have lots of individuals who want to work, who want to show up. Um, you have concerns from time to time from workers, but there's an avenue to deal with those, with those concerns. So when you're dealing with essential services, I like trying to get persons who have um, life-threatening uh, situations. You want to make sure that you minimize um, having any interruption in service. Last week, EMS employees sent PHA a letter listing their concerns, which include malfunctioning EMS vehicles, inadequate equipment, health insurance, and exposure to tuberculosis and cholera. Pinder says it is wrong for any employee to stage a sick out without receiving instructions from the BPSU, adding that workers should have given PHA officials sufficient notice to respond to their concerns before taking action. He noted that officials are now working to address those issues. However, he feels the labor minister is wrong for making such comments. I am concerned with the remarks that a press person came to me with, um, and this is their remarks, indicating that they had interviewed the minister of labor who said that um, those persons would have been suspended without pay. And at the end of the suspension, if they're not satisfied, that those persons were in fact ill, that they will go, they will move the terminations. And I am saddened by those remarks coming from the Minister of Labor, being a former trade unionist himself, knowing full well that um, in spite of him being minister, they still have to follow the policies, guidelines, and procedure of the Employment Act and our industrial agreement and the discipline policy of PHA. And so I do not wish to have any ministers of this government threatening unnecessarily. Furthermore, he says PHA officials had no right to suspend his members without explaining in their letters which part of the industrial agreement and discipline policy they violated. He's calling on the public hospital's authority to submit new letters or allow those employees to return to work. Yes, until they can actually quote um, the infraction. I feel as though these suspensions are illegal.
The BPSU president says he will file that trade dispute if he does not hear from PHA officials within 48 hours. Reporting for NB12, I'm Gwani Toot. Shane Gibson also saying today that it is unfortunate that he was not advised of the sale of a hotel on Paradise Island before the deal went through. 200 employees at the Paradise Island Harbor Resort feared their future was in peril last spring when the impending sale of the all-inclusive resort was made public. While those fears were confirmed when Guardian Business learned the resort was sold at auction for at least $6 million late last week. Gibson says employers have a certain obligation to government before closing their doors. The law requires um, businesses to advise the Department of Labor whenever there will be a reduction um, in the workforce. And so for them to close without, um, uh, I have to assume not notifying, I have not received any information yet. I'm not sure if my department has, um, I knew they were experiencing some problems. Um, somebody advised me that the um, hotel was up for auction, um, but um, I never knew that they, were, they had intended to um, make those employees redundant and send them home. The resort was owned by Driftwood Hospitality Management and Lehman Brothers Holdings, Inc., and the successful bid went to Warwick International Hotels and Resorts. And while the future of those workers may be uncertain, Gibson says there are hundreds of other workers who find themselves unemployed and are running out of options. He, however, was unable to comment on the findings of the recent labor force survey, which indicated that unemployment was down during the reference period in the last week of April. The economy is very soft right now. I mean, unemployment is, is at a level that we would not want it to remain at. We're trying to see how we could um, introduce um, quite a number of developments to decrease the level of unemployment. And so if you are one worker without a, a job being made redundant, that is significant, uh, particularly in this type of environment. Um, you know, on a regular basis, on a daily basis, if I don't get at least 100 persons um, trying to reach me through Facebook, um, through emails or directly at one of my offices, um, I won't have one. And so um, you have lots of indiv individuals that are looking for work. And the fact that they've closed down um, is a very sad occasion for us. Gibson again encouraged workers who are recently unemployed or find their jobs have become redundant to apply for unemployment benefits as soon as possible. Gibson added that government welcomes a reduction in the unemployment rate and will soon implement a follow-up in the 52-week employment program. That, he says, should be unveiled by the Prime Minister sometime soon.